This is Radio 2. Once again, we invite you to Stop the World as Francis Matthews, Ronald Fletcher, Sally Grace and David Timpson take an offbeat look at world events with the musical assistance of Richard Dijons. And now here's the man to bring this sentence to a full stop, Francis Matthews. Stop the world. Well, the first stop on our round the world cruise of crazy but true cuttings is New York for this headline, proudly printed by the International Herald Tribune. U.S. Steel to spend millions on pollution. <laughs> That's Sally Grace there, the loveliest girl on the show. And next, <laughs> next to the august pages of the New Zealand Herald, who meticulously point out casualties in aviation are generally caused by involuntary vertical movement towards the ground. <laughs> There's David Timpson, who knows all about being down under. He's just bought a mini metro. <laughs> and talking of tiresome jokes... Hello, my name is Ronald Fletcher. <laughs> it's all right, it gets better. He goes home in half an hour. Read us a story, Ronnie. All righty, Franny. Ooh. From the Philippines' Manila Evening Post, many domestic beneficiaries living in state houses will lose $14.5 in additional benefit under the New Budgets Additional Benefit Scheme. <laughs> and they're just as daft in England. From the Worthing Herald comes this quote. I, Worthing Magistrate, told a shoplifter on Tuesday that he could understand him forgetting that he had a pair of scissors in his pocket, but he didn't see how he could possibly forget the two-pound hammer down the front of his trousers. <laughs> and to the strains of Ronald Fletcher's signature tune, we take another trip down to the Stop the World bargain basement to report on some of the odder ways people have of parting with their cash. And they're all completely true. Surely, Lancashire, 19-year-old Martin Bannister was driving his car over an unmanned level crossing when he had a slight brush with a British rail train. All 40 tons of it. <laughs> the car was a write-off, but he escaped unhurt. Two weeks later, a letter from the railway arrived at his home. Ah, the standard British rail apologise. Oh, no, no, nothing of the sort. It was a bill for £367 damage to the locomotive. <laughs> Do you mean to say they hit him and he has to fork out £367? No, £392. He also had to pay £25 fine for obstructing the line. <laughs> Now, we discovered that the Swedish army now used battle tanks that can be made completely watertight in order to ferry themselves across rivers. Completely watertight, that is, if you remember to replace the plug in the tank's floor. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sergeant Kurt Vassman has a poor memory, and now Sergeant Vassman also has a very sunk tank. A 4,250-pound bill for a new engine, and yet another for 40 pounds for cleaning the mud from his gun. And now we have to thank a lady from Chelmsford for relating her husband's bargain hunting. He was quoted £20 to cut down a dangerous dead tree by his house. But he thought that was very expensive, so he decided to do the tree surgery himself. With a borrowed chainsaw, he set about the branches, and in no time at all... Timber! He had a £60 bill for his new garage roof. <laughs> A man called Huell Bryant. Oh, sorry, Ronnie, you've got that wrong. Oh, it's sorry. pronounced Howell. Howell? Yes, Howell. Oh, well, you. that's according to actor Huell Bennett. Ah, thank you, thank you very much. Right. Howell Bryant and his fiancée stopped at a Wiltshire pub for what they hoped would be a cheap snack. Strangers here, aren't you? Said the landlord, who was no fool when it comes to recognising people he'd never met before. <laughs> well, they talked of their drive back from the seaside. Drive, you say? Ah. 
only I didn't see you park in the car park. Well, no, they hadn't since it was full up. They parked against a row of terraced houses opposite. Oh, I should not have done that. Why not? Wondered how. There weren't any yellow lines. Sunday afternoon, it was locked up properly. The car still looked safe enough. I mean, what would he say to them? That there was a mad pensioner wielding an axe at... Oh, boy! Boy! I, that's my... That's my car! What... What Mr. Bryant didn't realise, of course, was that the locals all knew about 70-year-old Mr. Todovich and his threat to take an axe to any car that blocked his front door. It had been the culmination of a seven-year feud with his car-driving neighbours. Ah, that be why the car park be full. And even, though, <laughs> even though Warminster magistrates found Mr. Todovich guilty of criminal damage, no compensation was awarded, leaving Bryant to either forfeit his no-claims bonus or pay £750 for his repairs. <laughs> You know, Francis, I believe that marriage should be preserved. Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's much better when you're pickled. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be facetious. <laughs> I mean preserved as in looked after, nurtured, cherished, you know what I mean. After all, where would we all be if we weren't married? Down a pub, having a good time. <laughs> exactly. No, actually, Ronald, we have got a story of a marriage that's just up your street. You see, it's a conversation between a man and his wife overheard at the 19th hole of a Surrey golf club. If I died, would you marry again? Oh, good heavens, I mean, what a question. Well, would you? Um, I don't know, I suppose I might, yeah. Would you bring her to live in our house? <laughs> what? Would you bring her to live here, in our house? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, I don't know. I mean, I mind it. I just don't know. And would you let her use my mini? <laughs> Heavens about how do I know? I mean, I suppose so. I suppose I might. I mean, what a subject to raise, anyway. And would you let her use my golf clubs? <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Of course not. She's left-handed. <laughs> Ah, well, suddenly that reminds me of something I overheard the other day that concerns marriage. A man was busily arguing with his wife and finished by remarking, in ten years of marriage, you've never once agreed with me on any subject. To which she, not to be outdone, replied, It's eleven. <laughs> <laughs> and from marriage to where else but... That was Tammy Wynette with an S-O-N-G, all about D-I-V-O-R-C-E. And our first case comes from Stockholm, where Kirsten Holm told the court that her husband used to call her the eighth wonder of the world. And that was till she found he was still dating the other seven. <laughs> <laughs> Decree granted. And in Dallas, a lady asked for a divorce because of her husband's cat. He used to swing it by the tail and hit her with it. <laughs> Decree granted. And in Wisconsin, a man went even further. He took his sheepdog to bed and banished his wife to the kennel. <laughs> and now, from how relationships end to how one began. Richard Digens has a song about it. When we from the East End travel up the West End To see a fancy play or musical we only go on birthdays, or if we win the pools, or failing that, we never go at all. For mixing with the Duke of Kent and then the Prince of Wales, ain't everybody's way of having fun. And then the Duke of Marlborough and Lord Raglan in the Strand, they were open, so we dropped in every one. When we got to the show, we were half an hour late. The man on the door said, Julie Andrews couldn't wait. Drinking with such noblemen was so hard to refuse And if them or Julie Andrews, well I know which I would choose Me and me mates were bored the other afternoon We couldn't think of anything to do We went to watch the Orient, that's how bored we was And we spent an hour looking for the queue We went to see the manager to see if it was on But all he said was, get changed lads, you'll do I said, hang on a minute, Gov, I've got a dodgy back. He said, only one, mate, we've got two. <laughs> we got to the game, we were half an hour late. They knew that we were coming, so they made the others wait. Playing with the Orient, I knew that we would lose. And if them or Julie Andrews, I don't know which I would choose. 
And then there was Yvonne, who thought the law was not that strong, and it wasn't judging by the time she broke it. She would beat up gangs of thugs, and she'd take all sorts of drugs. In fact, if it rolled up, Yvonne would smoke it. Up before the beak, for trying to mug a Greek. Two years, said the judge, and banged a gavel. Now she's trying to find her way out of Holloway. She's even tried a note to Jimmy Savile. Well, I never call her darling, sweetie pie or love. She'd belt me if I called her anything but gov. It's embarrassing the way she always swears at fancy do's. But if her or Julie Andrews, well, I know which I would choose. And Julie would lose. Yeah, I know what I would choose. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Well, let's stop a different world here and delve into the brown manila limbo of office life for another batch of bureaucratic bungling at its British best. Sally. You see, you have to be specific, as Miss E. Driver from Nelson found when she tried to check on 50,000 washers her engineering firm was expecting by rail. After much correspondence, she phoned the local lost property office and was told... Washers? No, love. The only unclaimed goods we got here is a sack of, uh, let me see a minute. Yeah, thousands of metal discs with holes in the middle. <laughs> Bureaucracy is all explained for us in the Marlborough Express, New Zealand. One paragraph reads, uh, He was not really a permanent staff member, as permanent does not have the same conditions within hospital boards as it does within public service. He was a permanent staff member in a temporary position. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Britain, our infamous gas board left machinery outside Sheffield's blind institution and a welfare director complained. The servants of the gas board replied... Well, I know, and it was a blind institution. We put twice as many lights round it so it could be more easily seen. <laughs> Naked city, with all the naughty bits covered by Central Park. <laughs> it's midnight, and Tommy Judge is walking his girl home past lonely Lover's Lane. Mm. Say, Tommy, can you hear music? No. <laughs> well, good night then, Caroline. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm sure I can hear music. Listen. Nope. Nothing. But I know how you feel. Good night. Night, Tommy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, I, I can hear music. And so could Tommy. Every time he kissed her, they were entertained with selections from the classics. Tommy heard a lot of music that spring. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought you hated Beethoven. Mm -hmm. mm. I think I'm beginning to appreciate him. Let's just make sure. But the noise was driving Caroline to distraction. Chided by Tchaikovsky, provoked by Prokofiev, she was examined for three weeks by specialists. Just one more kiss, Caroline. A me medical <laughs> specialist. <laughs> when finally the root of the problem was extracted by her dentist, one of Caroline's metallic fillings was picking up the local radio station. <laughs> now, the musical molar has been refilled and Tommy has gone suspiciously off the classics. Oh, yeah. The tooth business is all over now. Now it's about this gramophone record up my nose. <laughs> Answering a query regarding a forthcoming social evening, one parish minister in Kent wrote... I, I cannot quite understand your inquiry. The purpose of the concert is that the young people of the village get together and the results of their efforts be given to an orphanage. <laughs> And for our next story, we visit the land of matadors and toreadors, castanets and cognac. <laughs> yes.
yes, East Kilbride. And <laughs> the sad tale of Andrew Carhill. Hello. Hello, Andrew. Andrew's wife has just given birth to a son. Uh, hello. And Andrew has been out celebrating. In fact, he's been out celebrating rather a lot. Oh, leave off. I'm just as jubilant as a son, Jimmy. And he's decided to rob a nearby branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland in broad daylight. Now, the raid didn't start too well because Andrew and his accomplice... Hello. <laughs> friend of the family. <laughs> they couldn't get through the glass front door of the bank and the staff watched fascinated as they both tried to open the window instead. Hey, let us in, will you? So then they took so long to climb a security screen to get at the money that a teller was easily able to phone for help. And even then they might have got away if they hadn't stayed in the bank counting the money until the police... <laughs> arrived to arrest them. Mind you, Andrew certainly made up for his blundering with the excuse that he gave the arresting officers. I was going to open an account with the money. <laughs> Before being whisked away to be given a three-year jail sentence. And still with banks comes this one that's for sale, provided you're prepared to move to South Africa. Delightful old bank for sale in the heart of Krugersdorp. A unique blend of rustic charm and barred windows, only broken into once, in need of some modernisation, and a piece of wood to go over the tunnel. <laughs> the bank has simply become too small for the town's needs and has been put up for sale with, as yet, no takers. Despite its unique claim that it was once the site of South Africa's largest ever raid and that a reward of 50,000 rand is waiting for the person who can supply the right information. Mind you, Matthews, I know one man who I'm sure won't want to go near a bank for quite a while. He was a customer at the City Bank on 200 Park Avenue, New York. Well, I'm all agog. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> no, not it doesn't all. hurt. No, no, no. Well, that's fine. Now, he filled out a withdrawal slip and handed it to the teller, but unfortunately never looked on the back of the slip. For printed on the back in block letters by some smart addict was the message, this is a stick-up. <laughs> Good heavens above what happened. Well, the teller pulled an alarm and in seconds the police had the customer in custody, finally releasing him an hour later after he managed to convince them it had all been a great cock-up. Steady, Fletcher, language, really. <laughs> David, have you got your didgeridoo out? Oh, uh, <clears throat> nearly. <clears throat> <laughs> Better now? Much. Well, give us an Australian story, then. Right. <clears throat> Sir Robert McGarry, Vice-Chancellor of the Chancery Division of the High Court of England, spoke at a Sydney Law graduate's lunch where he gave these words on the medical opinion he had heard of his own profession. Um, 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 you can always tell the state of a lawyer's health by looking at his mouth. If it's shut, he's dead. <laughs> and hold on to your seats, there is more. From the Australian Institute of Urban Studies. It is conceivable that life in an outer suburb of Sydney or Melbourne might not always be regarded by possible migrants as the next best thing to paradise. Well, really, Francis, do you have to be so unnecessary, darling? <laughs> Why don't you try and make yourself useful? Think of all those canaries with uneducated vocals. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's true. The Russians of all people have bred a special canary that can sing bass for a canary singing group whose repertoire includes Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. The canaries trained by Mr. Fedor Fomenko actually include sopranos, tenors and falsettos and the bass canaries have now given the group complete harmony. <laughs> Thank you, Roger Whittaker. <laughs> Now, here's Richard Dydens with a song about canaries who are not quite so happy. Sorry. I bet you leave that in as well, don't you? <laughs> I shouldn't be down this mine at all. A canary should be in the sky. All oh, the miners look at me and hope that I won't die If I do they're in trouble, come to think of it so am I I have to say it's the only way I'll ever get up in the sky I have to say it's the only way I'll ever get up in the sky 
It ain't exactly wonderful to be sitting down here for hours. It's hard to gauge the gilded cage of tropical scents and flowers. All I get is dust on me beak and grubby black marks on me wings. You feel so crude, you ain't in the mood to wobble your beak and sing. You feel so crude, you ain't in the mood to wobble your beak and sing. Everybody has a hope, and my hope is one day. They'll bring me out this coal mine and they'll let me fly away. I'll sit on trees and telegraph poles and sing till me throat is sore. And I'll tell thee they won't see me down in a mine no more. Yes, I'll tell thee they won't see me down in a mine no more. I'm a yellow canary and I should be up in the sky. Why am I two miles down when I should be two miles high? I never wobble me wings about, all I get is cramp. And I don't know where I go, they won't even give me a lamp. No, I don't know where I go, they won't even give me a lamp. Well, and that was... Richard Digens, who has at various times been one quarter of the Richard Digens Quartet, one fifth of the Nolan Sisters, <laughs> and one sixth of Dennis Roussos. <laughs> and this is Ronald Fletcher, who has been nine tenths of the Ronald Fletcher Band. Thank you. It appears that a balloon vendor at Chicago Fest, the city's massive ten day festival along the shores of Lake Michigan, was recently charged with murder because he shot a man he claimed had popped one of his balloons with a cigarette. Now, that's funny. I just heard Diana Dawes was facing two similar charges. <laughs> and if all that was a bit too exciting, didn't sound all that exciting, then take a step through here. Hello. 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 What on earth was that? The Dull Men's Club in San Francisco. <laughs> the what? It's perfectly true. Joe Troyes is a San Francisco man who believes that Americans have become obsessed with being important and interesting, so he's decided to do something about it and form a club exclusively for dull people. A dull person always gets the job done. Is his dull message to dull employers everywhere. And he's hoping for a big turnout to prove the point. He's holding a dull rights convention later this year where three dull hours of speeches are planned. It all promises to be a really dull affair. <laughs> and that's really where the story ends, because Joe and his followers aren't prepared to tell anybody about themselves or their club for fear they might appear to be, well, dare I say, interesting. And once again, it's time for the Stop the World Facto File, and we start with Sally. The proverb, silence is golden, translates into Spanish as flies never enter a closed mouth. <laughs> or in spoken English, shut your cake out. <laughs> Bananas breathe. What? Pardon? Oh, well. Bananas breathe. Yeah. They do. They, they inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide and generate their own heat. Hello? <sighs> <sighs> uh, who's there? A banana. <laughs> yeah. And did you know, Matthews, that if all the paved runways in Miami were laid end to end, they would reach 4,000 miles to Alaska? Yeah, which would mean you could fly from Miami to Alaska without leaving the ground. Mm -hmm. In the desert, never take your shoes off. In the intense heat, your feet swell up so much that it's almost impossible to put them back on. So now you know why you can never seem to find a shoe shop when you're out shopping in the desert. And if all these strange facts didn't leave you all amazed, then I'm not at all surprised. You know, Matthews, you're already quite a snappy dresser. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. No, not at all. Oh, you know, my attitude is, naked I came into this world and naked I shall leave it. Yes, but you could try and put some clothes on in between, couldn't you? No. Uh, don't, be a, don't be a fool, Matthews. I'm not nude. No, I just happen to be wearing a, a very tight-fitting pink cat suit. <laughs> and it gets worse. The Northern Advocate, a New Zealand paper, has this story. Mr. Morwood had said he would not serve him in the bar while he had his Hells Angels gang gear on. After a short argument, the man took his trousers off and was served his order. 
<laughs> Mind you, it's no better back in England if this sign in a Cornwall cafe window is anything to go on. Strawberries and cream, 65 pence. Nude strawberries, 50 pence. <laughs> David, I believe you've got a circular. Circular what? <laughs> no, 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 I mean a circular to finish with. Oh, oh, yes, you mean the circular from the Time Life magazine. If I am not delighted with Blitzkrieg, I may return it within 10 days. You will then cancel my subscription to World War II and I will owe you nothing. <laughs> well, if only we'd all known at the time. And from the press... Cases of poisoning have been reported as a result of the consumption of you. The leaves and seeds are poisonous and one of the symptoms is sudden death. <laughs> And another is a certain lack of get up and go. Ronald. Yes, my final story comes from the Lambeth Local. It's a newspaper, not a pub. This year's contest for the title of Brian of Lambeth will be held at Lambeth Town Hall. <laughs> and uh, finally, our last story comes from a lady whose daughter brought home a violent red and yellow painting from school. She was obviously very pleased with it, so her mother asked her, what was it? A dog or a pussycat? Don't be silly. The little girl replied, it's paint. <laughs> Thank you and good night. You've been travelling round the world with Francis A to Z Matthews, Ronald Freeway Fletcher, Sally Pretty Root Grace and David Spare Tinson. Musical diversions were provided by Richard Digence, researcher David Ryder provided the primus stoke, and the travelling rug was supplied by writers John Langdon and Geoffrey Atkinson. And always on hand with a screwdriver was the producer Alan, third right, fourth left, fifth rate, Nixon. Good night. <laughs>